So we're going to talk a bit about the clinical decision making and management um, and medical management in myocardial bridges. We could make this a really short talk. There's not a lot of data as far as um, how to uh, medically manage these uh, people with myocardial bridges, particularly in children. So we're initially going to start with kind of very quickly what myocardial bridges are, talk a little bit more about whether it's a normal finding or something that we need to worry about. Is it a problem? and then the medical management that I can find, could find out there. So as we've already talked about, myocardial bridge is muscle overlying a segment of the coronary artery in its most simple form. 70% are typically on the LAD and about 30% are right coronary lesions um, and about somewhere between around 20% have, uh, depending on the study you look at, have uh, both vessels, multiple vessels affected. So this was initially detected um, in 1737 um, on an autopsy and then described angiographically in 1960. As we already said, it's usually the mid-LAD, 70%, and it typically causes systolic compression of the epicardial coronary artery. And the degree of coronary obstruction is determined by several different things, the location of the bridge, the depth, um, superficial versus deep, uh, the length of the bridge, and the contractility of the heart. So is this a normal finding? Probably in most, yes, because angiographically, we only see at most 16% of these at rest, and even with provocative testing, we only see 40%. In autopsy series, however, the frequency of this has been said to be as high as 80%, but as Dr. Rogers said yesterday, I think the most accepted um, frequency of, of these myocardial bridges is somewhere between 35 or 25 and 30 percent of the population have them. So is this a problem? That's kind of what I felt like when I tried to figure out is this truly a problem? And I think traditionally it's been considered a benign issue, but there are reports of problems as we've already discussed. Ischemia, coronary syndrome, spasms, arrhythmias, exercise related problems, and dysfunction. And the thought is it's systolic compression of the coronary artery. However, as was mentioned yesterday, only about 15% of the flow happens in systole. So why is this a problem? I think there's factors that make the bridges more concerning. And these are age, what other issues may be going on with the coronary arteries related to age, what your heart rate is. So when your heart rate goes up and you have less diastolic filling time, does it become more important? If you have issue, other issues with your heart that may cause ventricular dysfunction, LVH, um, things that may make the bridge more significant, or if you have the, any atherosclerosis. So as far as medical management, if it's an incidental finding, no symptoms, don't need to do anything. If people have symptoms, exercise stress testing may show signs of ischemia, um, angiography with IVIS, and typically with FFR as well can be performed to, to evaluate the true significance of, of this. CT will help us find the depth of the coronary. We also do stress MR to look at the perfusion. And um, we don't do it here, but stress echo is also used in, in defining whether or not these are problems. So I put this up here largely to show the difference in diastole and systole, uh, particularly with the dobutamine stress. You can see the, the size of the coronary definitely decreases in systole with the dobutamine stress. But again, systole is not where the coronaries typically fill. So is this a problem? There's several um, published management strategies. I chose a couple of them. There's no guidelines per se. There's no kind of AHA, ACC guidelines that I could fall back on uh, to do this. So I, I picked a few. They're actually all quite similar. If you define a myocardial bridge, which can be done either um, by CT or cath uh, typically, and there's no clinical symptoms, then most people would say to manage this by reducing the risk factors of other related heart problems. And then there, there are some that consider antiplatelet therapy just with the diagnosis, not necessarily symptoms. And then follow-up. And follow-up periods vary. Follow-up, some. Uh, some of the 
articles that I was looking at say every six months, some say once a year, and some say actually you can wait even longer than that between follow-up. If they develop clinical symptoms or if they present with clinical symptoms, beta blockers are the first line um, and pretty much the only line of treatment that I could find, of medical treatment that I could find uh, for bridging. Avoidance of vasodilators is also important. Um, and then the same treatment as far as relieving triggers, risk factor modification, and considering antiplatelet therapy, particularly with atherosclerosis. If there's improvement with this, then it, you, we go back to the follow-up pathway. If there's not improvement and they're still having symptoms despite the, this, then um, the next step is the uh, cath and surgical management, which will be discussed in a few minutes. So just to talk briefly about our um, management of these, on all of these patients, if they are found in typically here, I think we find them by CT. CT can be done for other reasons, not specifically looking for this frequently. And the testing that we obtain is an EKG echo exercise test. We, uh, for perfusion and delayed enhancement, we do stress MR and then the CT, which is usually actually the way they come into us for myocardial bridge. We do discuss this at our multidisciplinary coronary artery program meeting. And then this is kind of our decision tree that we use. So if there's symptoms that we think can be associated with ischemia, and again, as was stated yesterday, sometimes in these kids that's very difficult. Teenagers have, or actually all children, but teenagers it seems in particular, have lots of chest pain frequently, almost always not cardiac. They pass out, almost always not cardiac. But if, if it is aborted sudden cardiac death, if it's syncope with exertion that we think is related to ischemia or uh, we can reproduce, or other symptoms that are highly suggestive of ischemia, then we go down the YES pathway where the next step is to do the, a cardiac cath with angio, IVUS, and FFR. If on that we find significant compression, then surgical intervention would be our next step. If not, then we go to the beta blocker potential. If there are no symptoms or if we can't find any inducible ischemia, things like that, then we don't usually do beta blocker or uh, surgical or cath intervention. We do typically follow these kids every one to two years with an EKG, uh, occasionally typically getting an echo to make sure that the function has stayed normal, that there's nothing else that we need to worry about. To ask. We also follow them to ask about new symptoms, and sometimes we'll do functional testing later as well, particularly if there are symptoms that have developed. Focus on reducing the symptom triggers, so hypertension, treating hypertension, any hypertrophy, reducing the burden of tachycardia frequently with beta blockers, which will also help with um, hopefully allowing that diastolic filling time um, and trying to treat any poor contractility. Like I said, beta blockers, primary line. Calcium channel blockers have also been described, although much less frequently uh, than beta blockers. Risk factor modification, uh, encouraging healthy diets, activity. And then if there's atherosclerosis that is defined, considering some antiplatelet therapy. There was one article that I found that actually gave a classification uh, scheme for, very, for how to treat. So there's three types of patients with myocardial bridges based on this research. One where you have clinical symptoms but no ischemia and then type B is clinical symptoms and objective signs of ischemia by uh, non-invasive testing, and type C would be symptoms with um, altered coronary hemodynamics. And their recommendations based on their study is no treatment for those with no ischemia, beta blocker for type B, which is with ischemia, and then uh, on uh, non-invasive testing. And for those with altered coronary mechanics, it would be beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Nitroglycerin and other vasodilators are contraindicated. And the other thing I wanted to cover um, is the athletic portion of this. And as I looked, um, as I was putting this together at the authors on, uh, of these, I look out and I think many of them are in the first few rows here today. So. <laughs> 
there is a section on myocardial bridging and what they describe as being in the important par parts of myocardial bridging is the tunnel length that is long or deeper and deeper than three millimeters beneath the, beneath the epicardium. And that this is, these are the factors that create the greatest vulnerability for cardiac events. As far as the recommendations go, for athletes with myocardial bridges and no evidence of ischemia, there's no limitation to activities. And you can see the level of evidence. For those with a myocardial bridge and objective evidence of my myocardial ischemia or MI, they need to be limited to low and moderate dynamic and low, and mo low to moderate static sports. So those are those lower four boxes, which actually for a lot of the kids that I take care of, they can still do that. Um, in Texas, it's football, football, football. And that's definitely in there. Baseball, those kinds of things, running, still in there. So there's actually quite a bit of activity that these kids can still do, or these people, I, I pediatrics. So as far as if we need to do surgery or any kind of intervention, then for the first six months after the procedure, they need to be limited even further. Um, if there's no subsequent evidence of ischemia after those six months, however, then they can participate in all activities again. Um, and so that really does limit them for those six months, hopefully only, to um, pretty minimal activities. Um, bowling, I didn't, until I saw this the first time, I wasn't even sure that bowling was a sport, but I now understand that it is. Um, so that is all I have on the management. Thank you.